Hey, this is Rick from Four Community, creating community spaces so you can connect with others and also with God. For a little while, when I first started working as a pastor, I had this all or nothing mentality. What I mean is that I believed that as a pastor, uh, I could only be good at it if I was working 24 7. I had to do everything all the time. I had to make sure I was I was at every single event. And I really had to limit um, my social engagements or, or any other activities that, that I liked. I believed I couldn't do anything else. You know, I couldn't like motorcycles. I couldn't like movies. I couldn't like board games. I couldn't like video games. I couldn't have friends that weren't part of my job. I had a very limiting perspective about how to do a good job as a pastor. I mean, I really wanted to succeed. It wasn't coming from some kind of spirit of legalism or anything. And it's not like anybody was telling me this kind of stuff. It was a misperception that I had. If I didn't do 100% all of the time, then I was I was failing. That's called polarized thinking. I am all of something or I am nothing. That's polarized thinking. We still see that in some pastor social circles these days. Some t- pastors believe that to be a real pastor, one needs to be working full-time at a church. And people who are not, people who are co-vocational or bivocational, who are working as a pastor and also have other jobs, they're not real pastors. That's that's polarized thinking. It's a horrible distortion. And one of the things it does is it causes people anxiety. It can totally trigger someone and cause them to move into an anxious cycle. Let me ask you a question. Do you recognize some polarized thinking in yourself? I mean, do you at times think that it's all or nothing? You may say something like, you're in or you're out. You're for or you're against. Or how about this one? Do or do not, there is no try. If you're watching this with someone, please consider pausing the video and sharing about how you sometimes fall into polarized thinking. I'd like to continue what we started in last week's video when we talked about the anxious cycle and how to interrupt the anxious cycle. We're going to continue on the same passage that we started, but this time we're looking at Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing then the God of peace will be with you. Hey kids, keep your eyes on the background for all of the characters and stuff that you'll see hidden back there. And also please remember to watch this week's episode of Connect HQ. I'd like to continue discussing how to interrupt the anxious cycle because you can interrupt your anxious cycle. I started with an illustration in this video about polarized thinking because that kind of distortion can start us down the road towards an anxious cycle. And I wanna build on what we learned from our last video, talking about how to interrupt those moments and what you can do right now. And it's so very simple. Well, it can be so very simple, at least for some of us. Many of us get into these anxious cycles at some level. I mean, we keep holding on to anxiety and we simply can't get ourselves out of it. So we need we need help. We need to learn how to interrupt that cycle. In the last video, we discussed how Paul learned how to interrupt that cycle by using prayer. Prayer breaks the cycle and allows us to choose something different to move us out of that into an empowering cycle. However, we left that video unfinished. We never talked about the empowering cycle, the peace bringing cycle, the life bringing cycle. When we interrupt the anxious cycle, what we do is we prepare our minds, we prepare our emotions, we we prepare our behavior for something else. We actually have to move into doing something else. And if we don't actually do or feel or think differently, what's gonna happen is we're gonna head back into that anxious cycle all over again. This text, which is continuing last week's text, it shows us what it is we do differently, think differently, feel differently, so that we don't get stuck going back into that cycle. Once the cycle's broken, something new needs to be pursued, and this is not passive. This is something we absolutely need to do. It doesn't happen on its own. So we're going to talk about being intentional about getting ourselves into an empowering cycle so we don't go back into an anxious cycle. First of all, intentionally think about something empowering and life-giving instead. 
The text says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Remember, the guy that's writing this, the the Apostle Paul, he's got nothing. He's in prison on his way to be martyred, so he thinks he's got absolutely nothing, but he still has control over some very powerful parts of him that allow him to break his anxious cycle. Once Paul broke the anxious cycle with prayer, his mind was guarded and he was able to think about different things that would protect him from going back into the anxious cycle. For Paul, he actually gives us a list of his go-to stuff that he filled his mind with to make sure he didn't fall back into the anxious cycle. When Paul breaks out of the cycle, he chooses what he's thinking about. And this is what I'm encouraging you to do. If you're caught in that anxious cycle, you break it with praying, and then you, your mind and your, your behavior and your emotions is in a different place now. Choose, first of all, to think about something different. And the very first word that Paul uses in this phrase is, is, think about what is true. And I love this, and I think this is so important because so many of the thoughts that fuel our anxiety are not true, which is why I started with a thought distortion. Here are some of the common distortions that may lead us down that road toward an anxious cycle. One thought distortion is called arbitrary interference. You know, we make conclusions from an event, but there's no supporting evidence. For example, you may be walking down the hall at your workplace looking at the people around you, and then you suddenly say to yourself, everyone can tell that I'm a total failure. The truth is, you don't know what everyone else perceives about you. Another distortion might be overgeneralization. We allow just an isolated incident or maybe two isolated incidents to allow us to generalize that all other situations will be the same. For example, after interviewing for a job and not getting it, you generalize by saying that you'll never give it, get a job and you feel absolutely hopeless. Another distortion is magnification and minimization. You perceive a circumstance as having greater or lesser significance than is appropriate. For example, you might say, I'm a loser, or you might say, she is no good, magnifying the negative and minimizing the positive. Or you might say, a coworker doesn't like me. It's because no one here likes me, and I'm horrible at my job, magnifying the negative and minimizing the positive. Another thing we can fall into is dichotomous thinking or polarized thinking. You know, experiences are classified as either all or nothing, complete success or complete failure. For example, if your neighbor behaves in a disappointing way to you, you may lose respect for your neighbor or may hate your neighbor and end the relationship. So for a better example, it might be you and your friend choose to vote for a different political party which causes you to end the friendship because it's your way or no way at all. You know, you got to vote with me or we're not friends. Very polarized thinking. And finally, just, just one more thing, labeling and mislabeling. Mistakes made in the past are generalized as traits. You know, for example, you calling yourself a loser all the time because you made one mistake in the past. These distorted thoughts can send us down the road toward an anxious cycle. And it's, it's these moments that we become almost our own worst enemy because we do it to ourselves because of what we're, we're thinking. Those are untrue thoughts. Those kind of thoughts pull you back into the anxious cycle. They're not true. Paul says that after he has interrupted the cycle, he makes sure he chooses to think about things that are true. So he's not pulled back into the cycle. So let me ask you, are you able to spot some of the lies that you tell yourself? Are you guilty of any of the common distortions of, of that short list that I just gave you that I briefly mentioned? If so, those are going to pull you back into an anxious cycle, which is why I'm telling you that once your mind is guarded, once your heart is guarded, after you've broken the anxious cycle by, by praying, lifting your head up and noticing that God is with you and still loves you, you then have to be intentional about doing something or you're going to fall back into your old patterns. And I'm also telling you a good place to start is with our thoughts thoughts. Be intentional about thinking about what is true. You are created by God, and in some way, you reflect 
his glory. You are created with a personality all your own, and you're invited by God to explore your strengths. He's given you many strengths. What is lovely to you? What is right to you? What is absolutely amazing to you? These are the things that we begin to fill our thoughts with intentionally. Because if we're just passive about this, those old distorted thoughts are going to come back and pull us back into an anxious cycle. So we need to be intentional about where our thoughts go after we break the cycle. Once you have interrupted the cycle, it only prepares your mind for something new. You now need to fill your thoughts with that new stuff. Think about what's true. Think about what's right. Think about what will fill you with hope and with life. Now, for some people, this is not easy. For some people, it's far easier to think about what's wrong with them and what's wrong with the world. For some people, their self-esteem is really low or they're depressed or they can't shake their distorted thoughts. If that's you, it's okay. You just may need to get some help from somebody that you trust. Say, listen, I'm having trouble, you know, not thinking about this thing. Just just give me a hand here. Someone who can help point out all that's good about you and all that's good in the world. You know, Paul didn't have the benefit of getting someone to help him uh, with this. So it looks like he created a list. He, it looks like he somehow wrote this down, maybe gave, gave himself a mental note about this, about everything that's good and right and lovely, all that stuff that he was forcing his mind to think about. Now, if you're not able to do it, that's okay. Then work with someone else who can help you for a while until you get the hang of this. Secondly, let's talk about our behavior. Intentionally behave differently. The text says, Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. When we begin to behave in a way that honors our friendship with God, we're moving away from the behavior that moves us down towards a place where we get trapped in an anxious cycle. For Paul, one of the things that he did that was truly life-giving to him and that he loved doing was being faithful as a Jesus follower and continuing to share the gospel. If you explore the letter of Philippians, you'll notice that he stayed active in sharing his faith, in his testimony, in telling people and showing people how awesome Jesus is. While he's been in prison, it looks like he's led some of his guards to Jesus. And it also looks like he's led some people from the house of the Herodians to Jesus, which, by the way, were the people who were plotting with the Pharisees to send Jesus to the cross. I mean, that's a really, really big deal. And he's doing that in prison with no resources. That kind of activity so inspired Paul and filled him with hope. But that kind of activity may actually stress you out a little bit. For Paul, it was life-giving. Let me ask you, what are some things that you do that gives your energy back? Does reading help? Jogging, board gaming, playing darts, walking through a mall, socializing, eating a mile-high mud pie at Montana's, or getting a blizzard at DQ, getting on your motorcycle for an hour ride or a day ride. Here's something vital that you can ask yourself to get you moving in the right direction with your behavior. Ask yourself, in what way can I grow my friendship with God right now by doing something that I really, really love to do. Now, IMO, when your thoughts and when your behaviors change, your emotions are going to change as well. If you're doing something you love to do, and if you're thinking about things that you really love to think about, your emotions are totally going to be playing follow the leader for much of the time within normality, I would think. Here's my summary. When you're caught in an anxious cycle, first of all, pray. It breaks the cycle by protecting your heart and protecting your mind, leading you to some peace and preparing you for what comes next. Number two, think. A guarded mind is able to make a choice to think about better things. So start thinking about those better things. And thirdly, behave. Apply what we know of the Bible to live as a follower of Jesus. Choose to do something you really love to do in a way that will also grow your friendship with Jesus. Pray, think, behave, and your emotions are going to follow suit. So you may have noticed along with me that this is not really a theological passage in the Bible, is it? This is one of those very, very practical passages, and it's one of the reasons I think that a lot of us look at the letter of Philippians in the New Testament as a psychology book of the New Testament. 
Paul is really getting helpful. Paul is really getting practical. And we see a little bit of CBT right here in the text. Will this method help all the time? Well, good grief. No, it's not going to help all the time. But it is a good start, though. If you need a little bit more help than this video, then let me just encourage you to ask for it. Because people are complicated, and we have no idea why people do what they do. So if you need some help, reach out and ask. To interrupt an anxious cycle, Paul gives us a heads up about what, what works for him. Pray, think, behave. Prayer stops that anxious cycle. Tell God everything that's on your mind. Thank him for all that he's, he's done for you. And that'll give you some peace, prepping your heart and your mind for something and your actions for something different. Think. Now that your mind has some peace because your mind is guarded now because prayer interrupted the cycle, think about all those wonderful things that you like to think about. And thirdly, do. Do something differently that won't bring you back into the anxious pattern. Do something that you love to do that will also connect you more deeply in your friendship with Jesus. That's it from me to you. For now, if you haven't yet, please subscribe, like the video, share the video, you know, whatever, whatever you'd like to do. That really helps me. I thank you for, for doing that. For community, creating community spaces so that you can connect with others and also with God. See you next time.